forgot our Swahili song. We could have sung that. Uh, Brother Schmooky sent a, a video to me. I need to send a link to the uh, to the group, uh, text text group, if you're interested. But uh, he he sent a a video of a friend of his, pastor friend. Who's uh, I listened to some of his messages and he's right on. It looks seems like a really good guy, sweet family, and uh, they he and his wife sing some songs in Swahili. They're there in Kenya. I guess I forgot to mention that. And uh, so uh, he sent a video. We played it this morning in Iola. I had to send you all a link to it. It was a blessing singing a song in Swahili and just to be reminded. And that's kind of what this conference is about, or this uh, this f- focus on world missions this month about just reminding us that there are different people groups all over, different languages, different uh, people uh, outreaching to those folks and uh, ministering among them. And so anyway, that's a blessing. So uh, I'll try to remember to send that to you guys. All right. Now, uh, Thursday, I kind of mentioned we we're talking about the African culture and the influences on the United States. And I stopped short of, and I don't think I mentioned very much about this. I might have mentioned it briefly, but the uh, the black American culture today is diverse. I mean, it's different, distinctly different than the African culture. It's like a subculture that's been created over the over the years uh, by different from different circumstances. But I want to go ahead and talk about that today, even though I wouldn't consider black Americans as a whole being Africans. That's why I don't prefer the term African American. But uh, uh, but I do want to mention that because that's a large people group that we would be ministering to and look around. The majority of, yeah, it looks like every one of us is white <laughs> or, or whitish, okay, mixed or whatever. Um, so I thought I would talk about this reaching black America in 2021, okay? And uh, probably won't be any great like profound, you know, things to share with you. But let me just give a little background. Uh, you know, unfortunately, our society, and I'll mention more about this later, but our society is in a weird place and a, a very unfortunate circumstance that hasn't gone away. It's been there for many, many years where there's just drama and, uh, and, and a lot of discomfort among whites and blacks, you know, as a whole. Some of it's been blown out of proportion through media and all that. Some of it is just real. I mean, you know, some people <clears throat> grew, have grown up and only seen pretty much white faces, you know what I mean? And so then they are in a situation where they meet somebody who's black and it's it's uncomfortable to them because they're not used to that. I was at camp, uh, senior camp here a few weeks ago. I don't remember how long ago. And, uh, and again, you know, it's kind of like what we're normally used to. Like there's in independent fundamental Baptist churches, there's just not a lot of black folks go to it. So at camp, it was kind of like that handful of black people, not very many. And there was this one teenager, black black kid that was hanging around a, a whole bunch of other white kids. They were kind of more country boys, right? They seemed to all be getting along, but there was one boy laying down. I don't know all the details. If Brady knows something that, that I don't know, just don't say anything because you'll mess up my illustration. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but this is seriously what I heard. Okay, uh, I'm I'm listening, and 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 the black guy asked one of the white kids what his problem was. Like, what's wrong? Why why are you just like keep backing away from me and everything? And I don't know if he's joking or what. I don't think so. I think it was he was serious. He said he said I've had bad experiences. I was like I'm uncomfortable around black people. I've had bad experiences with your kind. And I thought, oh. <laughs> Oh boy, because you just always feel like there's going to be offenses, there's going to be drama, there's going to be this big blow up. And I'm thinking a lot of a lot of other youth pastors or whatever, or pastors would have been like, hey, 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 you know, let's break it up. Don't say your kind. I mean, that's offensive. Nowadays, if you just say black, I mean, I'm serious. We've been in children's ministry long enough, and I've been that black boy over there, and they've been like, you're racist. And I'm like, how else do you identify? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, so you know, but a lot of people would have been like, oh no, let's let's protect. I'm thinking I'm not going to break it up. This is a good, healthy discussion. You know, now if a fist fight breaks out, I might go over there and break it up. But you know, they need to learn how to deal with the fact that, hey, you're black, I'm white. We've had some disagreements with, uh, you know, I've had some disagreements with some black people before. The black people probably had some disagreements with the white people before. And I'm thinking, hey, this is healthy, man. This is how this is how humans learn how to deal with differences with other, other people. But unfortunately, it is it is weird. There's a you know, d- depending on how you how you've been raised, who you've been around. I mean, 
Uh, I honestly, I was raised in a military family. I went to school on military bases and it really, you know, I'm not gonna say it wasn't there because it's always there, it's human nature, but I don't ever remember feeling like racist, you know what I mean? It was like every, and the military families, we all just kind of, we were all military, <laughs> we're military kids. So it didn't really feel that way. But I understand it when I see people, you know, st stressed out or whatever. I understand there's un uncomfortable because we're dealing with people that we're not used to. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm what I'm talking about. So how do we go about evangelizing or reaching, you know, as a primarily white church? Um, how do we go about reaching black people? And you know the answer is really simple. And it's this. Acts 5.42, daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. The same way we reach any people, <laughs> right, in Kansas City, we're going to knock every door, we're going to preach the gospel to everybody, and, uh, and that, is, that is the plan, okay? Just let you know right off the bat, that's my plan uh, for reaching black America, by reaching African Americans, by reaching Asian Americans, by reaching, you know, whatever... Uh, you know, Native Americans, you know, we're going to preach the gospel to them because the gospel is what changes lives and crosses cultural barriers. It really is. If you believe in Jesus Christ and you're saved and you don't have, you know, you're just, you just love people, then you don't, you're not going to have some of those, uh, those different things. But if you, you know, think about some, some white kid on a on a farm, you know, and he's grown up in this town of all white kids, and then all of a sudden he's forced into a situation where he's walking down the street and he sees a group of black guys. <clears throat> he might be intimidated. You know, I don't know. What am I going to do? How am I going to, uh, to talk to these people, you know? Because he's heard all these different things. You know, he might have had a grandpa that used the N-word. He might have, uh, you know, family members who talked bad about, you know, oh, them black people, blah, blah, blah. And so he's grown up that way. And so now he's just thinking that, and he's not experienced it himself. He's not actually dealt with, uh, uh, with that. It's, that's normal. And the other way is true, too, with blacks. You know, I never thought about this. Uh, and honestly, we've had just a couple of black guys in here. I think of Brother Josh, uh, you know, Adair. And, uh, and when he was in here, I never once actually thought, I wonder if he feels uncomfortable being the only black guy. I didn't really think about that. But I can about guarantee if you were the only white guy in a black church, you probably feel a little uncomfortable. And so I would assume maybe he did. I don't know. Uh, I never really thought about that. But the reality is there are sometimes some issues, and that's what I'm mostly going to talk about in this, uh, in this message. But first let me uh, point this out. Um, the, dem the demographics of America look something like this, okay? So um, I'm going to break it down. I try to break it down percentage-wise, so let's think in terms of 100, all right? I don't know. If we were in a church of 100 people, okay? I know we've got less than that. But if we had 100 people, and if we were in a part of the country that pretty much um, it was a good sampling of that of the demographics of the United States, okay? I don't know, I hope, hope that makes sense to you. So here's what I'm saying. It would look like this. If we had a good representation of the demographics of the United States, if we had 100 people in the church, 60 of them would be white, all right? That would match the, the you know, the, the, the demographics of the United States. 60 of them would be white. Now this is in the United States, not Kansas City, but in the United States. 18 would be Hispanic, 15 would be black, five would be Asian, two would be other. I don't know what that is. They just, they just threw everybody else in their other. I guess that's Native Americans and that's uh, uh, whatever. Because Asian, I believe, would also rep would be uh, including Indians, right? I'm talking about like from India. So, uh, uh, so anyway, that's, that's pretty low. Asians, pretty, uh, pretty low. Blacks, that's pretty low, 15%. Uh, Hispanic, 18%, that's pretty low even, right? That's why everything underneath white is called a mi minority because in the United States, 60% are white. And that's just the average, of, like, um, if I can trust the statistics that I read, right? But that's about the, the average. Now, in Kansas City, it changes slightly. And here is the, uh, the only change, the only significant change is blacks and Hispanics kind of swap places, okay? And so... You got 60% white, you've got 20% that are black, 10 that are Hispanic, and three that are Asian. And I believe black would, inclu would include, 
you know, those who are foreign born in Africa, or, you know, so African American. Uh, I believe that's the case. But look, all statistics get kind of are kind of hard to interpret sometimes. But the point is that in Kansas City, we actually have a larger portion of blacks than than the average United States, you know, population, uh, which is kind of surprising because you would think Kansas as a whole has a lower uh, black population, but that's not, that's not necessarily true. So in a perfect world where there was no prejudices, nobody felt uncomfortable and everybody, you know, uh, just felt right at home in this church. And we represented, uh, you know, pretty accurately the population of the United States, you know, we would have more black people in here, there's no doubt. And we would have more Hispanic people in here, no doubt. Okay? <clears throat> but there are some reasons why it, it doesn't work out that easy. It's not like you can expect to just automatically have a certain percentage of these different people groups, okay? And so let me list a few things that I think of. And again, I know all the messages this uh, month are going to be a little different and uh, they're actually pretty hard for me to preach because it's not typically the way I like to preach. But I'm trying to go through some facts and I'm trying to put before our minds different people groups out there that are outside of, uh, of what we're used to and so that we could remember that we need to reach everybody with the gospel and that there are going to be barriers that we have to deal with. Okay, so number one is this, culture. All right, and all three of these are just going to start with C, make it easier to remember. Number one, culture. Now, you know, I think everybody in here would agree that there is a, a black American culture. All right, and I mentioned that briefly last Thursday that some of that has influenced uh, American culture as a whole, and, and and most of that's great. You know, I don't, there's no problem with that. And then there are some influences that I would say are not God honoring. Uh, but as a whole, there are some basic things that are kind of like a black culture, if you will. All right, so from a cultural standpoint, many black people aren't going to feel like our church would meet their expectations. That's just the reality of it. They're going to come into this church and they're going to say, well, this isn't for me. You know, and, there's, and, and culturally speaking, that's just how it goes, okay? The style of music. All right. We are not, we don't sing songs that would match the typical style of the black American culture. All right. We just don't. Um, uh, some of it I like, if I'm honest, some of the, some of the, uh, you know, there's some I don't like for sure, but there are some influences there that would be more towards the, the black culture that, that I like that style. All right. The style of preaching. You know, what, are the, what is a st typical, now look, I mean, there's always exceptions, but what's a typical black preacher preach like? Not like me. <laughs> I don't get up here and uh, preach and uh, <laughs> you know, wave my hanky and... Uh, now look, there's some white guys that prefer that style and would feel more comfortable. Here's what's funny. A lot of people in the South are the ones who kind of like are the most thought of being the most prejudiced towards black people. But if they don't understand it, what's funny is there's so many similarities between some guys in the South and black people, right? And so uh, it's funny, but like a lot of the Southern churches, it's like, man, that's just like, well, going into a black church, okay? Even though they're white and maybe have some prejudices in, in many parts, okay? Uh, but it's not me. And I, I wouldn't try to make myself be something different right, to reach a, a particular people group necessarily. I mean, you know, I'm not against opening up my arms and welcoming somebody from a different people group, but I'm not going to, like, change my, my style and try to become somebody different necessarily just so that I can reach a certain people group. And, uh, and so even the style of worship, you know, uh, now I've been in churches, and again, that's more influence from the South, actually, but where they stand up and they lift up their hands whenever they're really feeling emotional or something like that. And I'll be honest, I feel uncomfortable in that situation. <laughs> you know, I remember, uh, I remember going to a church and this was a church. This was okay. So here's what I mean. I don't feel uncomfortable around black people in general. Right. 
but the culture of church, the style of church that a lot of black people are more comfortable with, I would feel totally uncomfortable in that church is what I'm saying. In Indiana, we went to a church, I remember that was, uh, it was some kind of Baptist church, but I don't remember what kind of Baptist. Uh, and it was actually primarily white uh, people, but the culture was that type of church that, we, that we're thinking about. So we went in there and there's, I don't know how to explain. I just remember I felt real uncomfortable the whole time. And there was time towards the end where I remember my mom, and I don't know if my dad was there. I don't think my dad was there that day. I can't remember, but it was kind of like, we're getting out of here. <laughs> and we all just left because we felt really strange. It was an uncomfortable feeling, okay? <clears throat> and so most black, uh, most, most black people are from families that are part of historically black Protestant churches, okay? So AME, African Methodist Episcopalian, I guess is what it is. The AME, we've got one right, down, right across the street from our house. And, uh, and, you know, I, I've met a few people that like mow the yard or, or that go there when I've knocked on their doors, soul winning, you know, that go there. Nice people. I'd probably feel really strange in there <laughs> with that style of worship, okay, and that style of music and everything. And that's just the reality. So I can understand that somebody who's used to that culture would come into our church and be like, I feel really weird. Why do they only have a piano, you know? They hear my wife singing and be like, why is she singing opera? That's what a lot of people say. They call it opera. She doesn't really sing opera, but <laughs> why is she singing opera? This isn't the church for me, right? That's just the reality, you know. Uh, there's different people. There's cultural differences. Now, I'm going to preach tonight in Iola uh, a message about transcending cultures, you know, because the gospel, and I should say just Christianity, Christ, transcends cultures. The gospel transcends cultures, right? And certain factors about what the Bible talks about us as human beings in general you know, transcends cultures. It's true for every culture. You know, we all pretty have much have more in common than we like to admit. Okay, but just from our perspective and just a human standpoint, we look around and there are cultural differences uh, that affect uh, uh, these kinds of things. So we also went to a, uh, we went to a funeral service when, uh, when we were in Oklahoma City. Uh, Valerie and I and the uh, I guess all the kids were there too. Was everybody there at the funeral? Or was it just mommy and I? Anyway, so we had we were on a bus route that was, I'm talking our bus route. So Southwest had 20, 22 buses. Okay, we were 15A and 15B. So we had two buses, and we would go into. We had one time like 180 people on two buses. <laughs> okay, so we would go, but we went down to. To me, the closest thing I've ever been to the ghetto, right? I don't, I don't know if you could call it the ghetto or not, but to me, it was the ghetto, right? And we went, that's where our bus route was. I mean, it just all black. If we saw a white kid in the neighborhood, we were like, who's that white kid? Because it was just, it was so black. And they got used to us, but at, very, at first, we stood out when we went knocking on their doors or whatever. We really stood out. Like, what are these guys doing here? And got a suit on. What's he, what's he fixing to do, right? Um... Is he with the government or what's going on? That's how we were treated a lot of times. But then they found out you're a preacher. Now, here's something interesting about the black culture. And, and you, can re, do, you can read up about the research here uh, that black America is way more spiritual in the sense of more of them go to church, more of them claim to be uh, religious, right, than, than whites, just per capita. Okay, but, uh, but once they found out that, that we were with the church, and, oh, that's the preacher man and all that. Well, then their attitudes change, and they're very respectful and all that kind of stuff. It was really strange. But, it, you know, we were there for, for several years, and we got very familiar with the culture and very familiar with uh, the faces and the bus. Like, you know, I remember one time one of the kids said, you know, I was getting on to him for misbehaving. And he's like, you're just picking on me because I'm black. And I was like, I'm literally the only white person on this bus. <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> and so, uh, so that's how it was. Like we got really familiar with that. And and to this day, my wife will still say when we go soul winning, that she feels more comfortable when when we're out making visits or soul winning when a black person answers the door, like a black lady answers the door, than whites because she gets really nervous around whites sometimes. I don't know why that is, other than we spent years uh, ministering to that demographic. And so, why did I say that? Okay, because I was saying. Thank you. So, uh, so I went to the fu so funeral because one of our bus kids uh, and and his mom were in a wreck and they died, and so uh, so we went to the funeral, 
And no doubt, I mean, no lie, my wife and I, I think it was just my wife and I, and we were the only white people in, the, in that church. And it was the stereotypical black service. All the songs were black, the way people dressed were black, the way they raised their hands and they worshiped. And I don't know that I heard speaking in tongues, but I mean, it was, it was odd for me. I felt very, very uncomfortable. Not because I was white and they were black necessarily, but just because this is, is not my style, this is not my culture, you know what I mean, when it comes to worshiping, praising, all that kind of stuff. And then, I told you we were in the ghetto, then we left and there was a drive-by shooting at the gas station right across the street. So, I mean, you know, you just felt like you were out of your comfort zone, you know. So, there are some cultural differences that will make uh, somebody feel like, hey, this isn't what I'm used to. This, is, this, isn't, uh, this isn't right. Okay, and so uh, primarily, as I mentioned, uh, the, the black churches, I mentioned AME, there's Church of Christ, uh, and then there's uh, mostly charismatic type style is, the, is, is the, the general type of church service that they're used to. So they come in here and we are like anti-charismatic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like We're not against laughing or saying amen or anything like that, but we're just, we are a non-charismatic church. Like I don't believe in gifts of, in the, in speaking in tongues or healing or, or any of those kinds of things. And so, uh, and so you could see why the average black American would come in here and they would feel like, yeah, this isn't really for me, you know? So what do I change all that and try to put on a show or, or, or change the, no, all I can do is when I'm going outside and uh, we're evangelizing, we're preaching the gospel, we preach the gospel to everybody and wel welcome them to our church. But if they come and then they never come back again, don't be surprised. <laughs> That's just the way that it is, you know. And so uh, there is also, when it comes to culture, there's also, and I alluded to this a little bit last week, there's the hip hop culture, right? That is almost like you're almost forced if you're black to be part of the hip hop culture and you would almost be like you know shunned or something if you weren't it seems like you know for for the most part and i'm telling you the hip hop culture is one thing that i can never get behind i can never be you know uh be part of that you know i actually tried in my teenage years i know you look at me and that's kind of laughable but but i actually had a friend that was black and i kind of tried to listen to the rap music a little bit and, and dress that style a little bit and it wasn't long before i was like you know what i'm a white boy i'm always going to be a white boy and, uh, and I just that's just what it is we were still good friends i still to this day talk to him and and I consider him a good friend all right but uh but the reality is there are cultural differences. Now, let me jump to uh, Acts 17 real quick. Go to Acts 17. So what about these cultural differences? You know, should we embrace them and just start becoming more, you know, uh, offer more for that demographic, you know, maybe change our music and all this? Stuff? Well, that doesn't make sense that we would try to change something, you know, to fit, uh, you know, that doesn't really make sense. But here's what I will say. I do believe that we ought to be willing to learn about all different people groups. Okay. And that's kind of what this, again, this month, that's what the focus is this month is learning about different people groups. And one of those right here in the United States a, that represents a pretty good portion of the United States is the black American uh, culture. I believe it is good for us to learn you know, a little bit about the culture. And uh, historically, you know, I got to be honest, I was very, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to say made fun of, but like the whole Black History Month and all those kinds of things, like I was just like, oh, what is it? You know, that's, but you know what? Regardless, I need to learn a little bit about what is going on through people's minds and in their hearts and how they feel, right? Whenever I'm trying to minister to them, take them the gospel. And so it's okay to study that culture a little bit. <clears throat> I actually had, uh, I forgot to mention this earlier, but when we were at Southwest also, there was a group that um, that church was very supportive of that was called COBA, C-O-E-B-A. It was called the Conference of Evangelizing Black America. So uh, so every year, I think it was just once a year, they'd get all these pastors together, primarily black uh, pastors and ministers, and they'd get together and they'd have the, a big conference and talk about uh, how do we evangelize black America. 
And so it was like kind of like put on by black people, for black people, about black people. A lot of white pastors went there too so they can learn, you know. Uh, but it makes sense, okay, if you're in a church that's primarily black people, well, yeah, we're going to have to figure out how can we evangelize black America. But if you're a white church and that's not your culture, that's not your style, I don't think you, there's really any need to say, hey, we got to have this special program to do this. We just go preach the gospel, like I said, to all people. And then if they don't fit, like this isn't the church for them, that's okay. Right. And so, uh, and that's what we got to keep in our minds. But I do believe while we're ministering to them, we shouldn't be so shocked as to what their culture is or, or, or what's being said about their culture or what's going on in the news, you know, or politically speaking in regards to black America, because then your chances of reaching them are, are way out the window because you don't have anything in common, you know what I mean, to, to start that conversation. Obviously, we want to give them the gospel. That's where the power of salvation is. Uh, but they have to want to listen to us <laughs> to begin with. All right, so let's see what, what Paul, a little bit about Paul and ministering to different cultures. I always find this interesting. Acts 17, look at verse 28. So he's talking to the people here in Athens, and uh, he picks up some things about their culture and some uh, some poet some some things that their poets say, say. And in verse twenty eight, it says, "For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we are his offspring." And so he begins to describe God, but he's describing God in an accurate way. He's not lying about who God is. He's describing him in an accurate way but he's using the words of one of their own poets, apparently. And so he's, he's, he's making mention of that, which I find to be interesting. Look at Titus chapter 1. Now, if you're a white guy, which is majority of us in here, uh, I'm not saying learn Ebonics and go to the door trying to sound like a black person because you're probably going to look dumb, <laughs> okay? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying be educated about about this, okay? I've known guys like that. Who's that guy uh, with the dreadlocks, big muscular, who's a preacher? Uh, something like Todd White or something like that. Anybody know who I'm talking about? And he's just like this total, like, like uh, I don't know if, if he'd be part of the hip-hop culture, but he's... He's just, I don't know, when I listen to him, I'm just like, man, be, just be who you are. Stop trying to, trying to be part of this culture, you know, and reach the young generation. Just be who you are. You can learn their culture and understand them, but you don't have to be like him. It just kind of blows my mind. I don't listen to him uh, at all for, for anything, but I just have seen a couple of things on him. All right, Titus 1.12. In other words, I'm not recommending you listen to him. All right. Look at verse 10, Titus 1, verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Uh, it's talking about the, Jew, the Jewish believers. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Okay, so that was something that one of these men had said, one of the Cretans had said, uh, you know, they're always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And so Paul picks that up and he uses that terminology and he says, hey, one of your own people said this, you know, and uh, and he uses that to to communicate with them. Look at 1 Corinthians 9. All right, here's a popular passage, You're probably familiar with this one. 1 Corinthians 9. And you have to get the the gist of what he's saying here and not take this out of context and take it too far like some people try to. But here's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 19, I mean 9, verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jew I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law of God, but under the law of, to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made 
all things to all men that I might by all means save some. You don't save them, Apostle Paul. Jesus saves them. Well, he said that I might save some, okay? When we go out and we're trying to get people saved, we're not going to be so worried about like, whoa, man, you, you're from a different culture. I just don't think we can even talk, right? We're going to try everything we can to cross those barriers, to cross those cultural differences and say, hey, what can I do to get you to listen to me as I present the gospel? I'm not going to change who I am. I'm certainly not going to be to try to be somebody different and be part of their culture and embrace things maybe that I don't even agree with. And I'm certainly not going to embrace the hip hop culture just so that I can reach somebody from the hip hop culture. I'm not going to become LGBT <laughs> so that I can reach. You see what I'm saying? That How far do you go with that? Like, oh, I guess I better dress queer. No, you better not. <laughs> I'm not going to change. That's not what he's saying. He's just saying that, you know, hey, when I'm trying to give the gospel to somebody, you know, I'm going to go ahead and, 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 and think about who it is I'm giving the gospel to. And that's going to maybe change, you know, some of the way that I talk to them, some of the, you know, some of the thoughts I'm going to try to pull from my memory banks, anything I know about their culture, you know, you got to be careful about that. But, uh, you know, here's what I found. This is not necessarily with black America, but here's what I found with uh, Hispanic people because we're dealing with, we're, I'm studying a lot about uh, the Hispanic culture and that's obviously who we're going to preach to on uh, on Saturday. <laughs> no matter how bad you are, you know, as a as an English speaking white person, no matter how bad you are at Spanish, they seem to be very happy when you try to speak Spanish to them. <laughs> it's just like, wow, this person, you know, is actually trying and they appreciate my culture and they're trying to, and sometimes I'll listen to you just because they want to, you know, to entertain that, that conversation and that, and that friendship. Okay. And so we got to use things like that. We got to, we got to understand that, you know, our focus here is not, uh, you know, to worry about what our culture is or what's wrong about their culture or anything like that. When it comes to preaching the gospel, our focus is preaching the gospel. I remember the time I, I, I've probably shared this with you before, but in Iola, Brother Dan was actually with me. It was one of the first times Brother Dan and I went soul winning. <laughs> it was crazy. Like, all right, we went soul winning and the first thing we were going to this low income or like a townhouse. All right. It's real, it's low income. And, uh, and you got a lot of people in there. We had been in there before. We'd knocked a couple floors. No one ever gave us a hard time. We had some good conversations. I think I got, I think we got somebody saved on, uh, on, on one of the times out there. And so I took brother Dan. I said, Hey, we can go finish up these townhouses. And I said, you know, I don't know if we're supposed to be in here or not, but we've never had any problems. No one's ever, you know, kicked us out. And then we go up to the, like the second, third floor, don't remember what it is. And there's these people playing, they're putting a puzzle together. And they're, they're actually fairly young people, but they're sitting around putting a puzzle together, which seems like an old person thing to do. But anyway, I like puzzles too. <laughs> and uh, they're putting the puzzles together and I started the conversation. And all three of them started talking. And before you know it, all three of them are admitting that they're not saved and they don't want to know how to be saved. And so I'm preaching the gospel to them. And I'm like, this is great. First time taking Brother Dan soul winning uh, in Iola. And I'm preaching to three people at the same time. All three of them are going to get saved. And out of the blue, this lady just comes up and says, hey, you guys aren't supposed to be here. I appreciate what you're doing, but you're going to have to go. And she kind of starts speeding us along. And I'm like, well, can I just finish up what I'm saying right here? Because they, they're listening. I haven't even knocked on a door yet, you know. And so anyway, I kind of wrapped it up and uh, left them with a verse and everything, but uh, but we ended up leaving. And so then we went to around the corner to this other low income housing area, and this guy pokes out his head and he's like, and he's like, "Are you guys?" Or I, I say, hey, "I'm Iola Baptist Temple, and I'm just out here. You got a few min minutes? I can talk with you." And he's like looking around. He's like, he's like, "Are you guys? You guys aren't snitches, are you?" I promise you. There should have been a red light that went off in my head that was like, something's not right here. But next thing I know, Brother Dan and I are both in this guy's house to preach the gospel, and there's like drug paraphernalia all over the house and a, a bong with smoke coming out of it and all this stuff. And we ended up realizing, all right, this guy's high. He's not even listening to us. And so we left him some literature and we left. But, you know, I remember thinking about that later on and thinking like, I'm totally against that lifestyle for sure. I don't want anything to do with that lifestyle. But I was so concerned about preaching the gospel to this guy that for a minute, I didn't even care that he was doing drugs. I didn't even care his story or anything like that. I just wanted, and I told him, I said, hey, I'm not a snitch. I just want to preach the gospel to you. I don't care what you're doing. I just want to preach the gospel to you. And I realized that after we left that I was like, whoa, I mean, should I like 
turn this guy in or, or you know what should I do because he was talking about actually how that's kind of a funny story he was actually talking about he was admitting all this kind of stuff because he was he was under the influence and he was like he's like actually man I, if if I got found out right now if anyone knew I was doing this man I'd really mess up my life because you know I was, I'm trying out for the police department <laughs> and he's like I wouldn't get my job and all that kind of stuff and I'm like I'm like dude I don't even care just forget about all that I just want to preach to you the gospel and so like you understand what I'm saying? Like, there's nothing about his culture, his lifestyle that I want to, I'd want to join in on. But at the moment that I'm trying to preach the gospel, I'm not focused on those things. And that's the way we should be with every human being out there that we preach the gospel to is be like, you know, let's just forget about this for me. Now you got to use wisdom. Obviously, there's sometimes when you know to walk away, this person is not ever going to get saved or reprobate, whatever. But cultural differences and even sinful things that they might be involved in to some degree, you know, is not our concern at that moment because we're just concerned about their soul. All right. Uh, number two, this kind of goes together with that, but with the cultural things. But number two, the second C is comfort. All right. Because of the cultural differences, many black people would feel very uncomfortable here. Now, some would feel uncomfortable for the wrong reasons, right? Like, you know, there's this idea out there that when people come into a church, they're supposed to be comfortable. And we just want you to come as you are, and we want you to feel welcome, we want you to feel comfortable. No, if you're living in sin and your lifestyle is wicked, you should be sitting in church with a lump in your throat. You know what I'm saying? Thinking like, man, I just don't know. I'm under conviction. I, I need to get right. We don't we're not worried about people being comfortable when they come into the church, when it comes to like preaching the gospel. Uh, you know, sometimes there's a certain topic that I'm preaching on and then we'll have a visitor that day and I'm like, Oh man, <laughs> but it's almost like a test. I always feel like God's saying like, Hey, you are willing to lose that person and just preach what I've told you to preach. Right. And so you got to do that and not worry about their comfort level. But you know, sometimes it's, it's just their comfort. They're uncomfortable from the, time that they set in there because like I said, and I, let's be honest. Okay. Let's forget about culture for a minute. How many of you, the first time you go to a church that you've never been to before are uncomfortable? <laughs> All of us are. I remember brother uh, Austin telling the story about the first time he went to, uh, to uh, Shawnee mission and he hadn't been to, uh, I don't know. I, I don't remember the whole story. He'll, have to, he'll, you'll have to ask him about it. But I remember that he was like, his mom drove him there. And when they got into the parking lot, he was kind of like, all right, let's go. <laughs> And he actually did go, if I'm, if I'm understanding right, didn't you? Okay, but his, his feeling, everything inside was like, never mind, never mind. Let's turn around and go. And we had somebody tell us, I don't remember if it was uh, Rob. I, I think it was Rob said he came one time to the church and he saw the cars there and he saw the building and he's like, nope, I'm not doing it. And he just drove off because he was uncomfortable, right? We all feel that way. So you got to realize when somebody comes to church, they're going to feel uncomfortable. Uh, and so, uh, so the comfort zone is one of the problems why people won't come to church and, and it's harder to evangelize them. Uh, even sometimes it's hard to preach the gospel to them because of un, uh, being uncomfortable. You know, they're, they're being uncomfortable by us. I mean, I don't know how many times I've talked to, uh, I, I can see in my face a couple different black ladies who, when I invited them to church said, are my kind welcome there or something along those lines. And I'm like, what, what are we living in the, 60s or 50s? <laughs> what do you mean? Is my kind well? Is my kind welcome at your church? <laughs> you know? But there's a reality there that some people feel like they're not going to want me there. You know what I mean? And so, uh, so comfort has a big part to do with it. And let me say this: people naturally tend to segregate into groups in which they're most comfortable. Right? Look, we all went to high school. It was like that. Right? All the skaters hung out together. All the the headbangers hung out together. All the uh, you know the rappers hung out together, and so you know we're we're all pretty familiar with that idea of hanging out with people in your comfort zone, right? And uh, and I remember hearing this guy talk about prison. You know, he was just talking about the ins and outs of prison. Somebody's phone. <laughs> okay. Uh, the ins and outs of prisons, and he said, look, he, this was a white guy. He was a like a Ma mafia guy or something, <laughs> but he's like, he said, look, say what you want. It's not right. Segregation. I know we say segregation is wrong. He said, but every prison is segregated. He's like, 
The black people are in this room. He's like, they're literally rooms. This is the black people's turn to watch TV in this room and the white people and then the, uh, the Hispanic. And sometimes one guy from one group will go into the other room he was talking about. He said, but for the most part, they're segregated. Now, why? Because somebody forced them to be segregated? No, because they're more comfortable around each other because they're used to it. They're familiar with that. Okay? So I don't promote segregation. I don't think that we should be segregated. I don't think there should be black church, white church, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. But I'm not against the church down the street from my house being known as the black church because they feel more comfortable with each other and their style of worship and everything. I don't think it's wrong. Okay? Now, I, ideally, there wouldn't be that discomfort. There wouldn't be that. We'd all just kind of like understand each other. and and Because uh, I think ideally... If we had a church of 100 people, my idea would be 60 white, 25, 10 Hispanic. <laughs> you know, if that's the demographic in, in, in Kansas City, that's what I would love to see. But the reality is that's not going to happen. <clears throat> the main thing is, go back to James 2. The main thing is to keep this in perspective. Look at verse uh, look at verse 8. James 2, verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are uh, convinced of the law as transgressors. Con uh, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet if in one point he is guilty of all, he's saying, look, if you're a respecter of persons, you're not really loving your neighbor, right, as yourself, because you're a respecter of persons. And he says we're not supposed to uh, be a respecter of persons. You know, when it comes to how somebody's dressed or what their background is or culture or whatever, we're not like, hey, you know, welcome to our church here. here sit in the good seat, right? And then another person comes in, and we're just like, oh, who cares about that guy? We're not supposed to be a respecter of persons. Uh, we're supposed to look at a person that's a soul, that's somebody we can minister to, that's somebody we can love. And, uh, and that's how, that's how we, should, we should go. Now, so one last point, and i got to wrap this up. Culture, comfort, the third is convenience, okay? And here's why a lot of people, you know, whether or not they get saved. And let me just, let me just say this. I would say, according to the demographics that I just shared uh, about, you know, even in Kansas City, According to, the, according to that demographic, when we're out soul winning, just hitting every door, right? We're going to hit all people from all these different, different groups. And I'm trying to think through how many people I've won to the Lord. And I think that's pretty, pretty close to hitting that demographic. You know, I've won a fair amount of black people to the Lord, won a fair amount of Hispanic people to the Lord, as long as there wasn't a, a language barrier. <laughs> And, uh, in, and it, it's pretty close to that demographic. Does anybody else agree with that? Or maybe even unproportionately, like maybe more, maybe you've won more blacks than whites, you know? How many say that you've won more minorities than white people when you're preaching the gospel? You think you have? That would make sense because we know where the places are the most receptive and they tend to be, you know, uh, uh, blacks or Hispanics, okay? So, but out of convenience, some people will not ever come to our church, even if they get saved, because it's more convenient to go with your family. And that, that, you know, that could hit on the comfort level and the culture level. Sometimes it's just more convenient. You got people there that you know. Uh, they're not going to you know, harass you. Everybody goes to church wondering, like, how am I supposed to dress? What am I supposed to do? And, and it's just so easier to just say, hey, I'll go with my family. Uh, you know, one thing that used to frustrate me is you get somebody saved, and then it's like nobody in their family, all their family members that went to church never cared about that person. And once you get them saved, it's all of a sudden like, hey, now that you're saved, you need to come to my church. And so, like, they, you know, they're going to church, but it's not it's not your church. And you're like, hey, we're the ones that gave you the gospel. But the truth is, it's convenient. It's convenient for them to go with family. It's convenient, you know, hey, their peer pressure. Hey, you need to come with us. You're part of us. You don't want to go to that church, you know, and all these kinds of things. All right. So let me wrap it up by just saying this about the uh, about reaching black people, uh, black America in 2021. 
I'm going to say this. I believe it's very true. Black people, unfortunately, today, in, in you know, 2021, have a ton of pressure put upon them, okay? They have a lot of pressure upon them. Let me give you some, uh, uh, some basic points about that. Number one, the media and the politics, Black Lives Matters, all that kind of stuff, is just putting in a, in a crazy amount of pressure on the average black person. Uh, in terms of, hey, this is how you're supposed to see law enforcement. This is how you're supposed to feel about white people. This is how you're supposed to, you know, you're, and it's just, that's a lot of pressure, you know. And it's unfortunate. You got white politicians, for the most part, who are pushing that kind of stuff. And white, uh, you know, left-wing people uh, who are, like, at the rallies and doing all that kind of stuff. It's not really that they care about black people. It's that they're, they're, they're raising all these kind of things for their political purposes. And it's really sad. It's unfortunate. Black people are the are a minority, okay, uh, and so that's always going to make you feel awkward. That's always going to be high pressure. You got something to prove. You know what I mean? Black people are in the you know if you look at the statistics, they fall. Uh, they're the highest group in the United States of, pov of in the poverty level. I don't know if I said that right. If you're looking at the highest amount of poverty broken down by different race, racial groups, it, the blacks have the highest amount of poverty. Now, it's only like 50% or something like that. I don't know what constitutes poverty. But white people and Asian people are about the same. Uh, uh, white, I mean, uh, uh, Asian, I mean, uh, uh, Latino is just kind of like a little bit lower than that. And then African Americans are... <laughs> or black Americans are uh, are well well under that, you know. So I think it's I think it's like f maybe fifty percent or higher who are in the poverty level. Okay. Now there's a lot of reasons for that. I could I could go either way. Like I could I could defend them and say, hey, it's not fair. White people are keeping them down, all that. Or I could look at the statistics and I could build this case and say, hey, you know, it's because so many of them are doing this and because they're not, you know. And, and some of those will I'll touch on here in a second. But the truth is, there's a good amount of them who live in poverty, okay? Black people are primarily, uh, that demographic has the highest amount of crime. It's just true. And so, like, if I was a black person, that would really put a lot of pressure on me because I'm thinking, like, people look at me and they don't know if I'm going to commit a crime or something like that just because I'm black. And that's not fair, but if you're looking at the records, the demographics, that's just the reality of it, okay? Okay. Black people uh, have the highest amount of disease. It's true. They're the highest. If you're looking at all the AIDS, um, I think even COVID, if I'm not sure, like they're the highest demographic of people who, you know, they just seem to catch a lot of these things that are out there. Uh, and, and, and I don't know what the reason is exactly, but that's just the reality. Black people have uh, highest amounts of fatherless homes. That's a lot of pressure. You know, if you're a black guy trying to do right, trying to live a godly life and trying to make something of your life and you're like, man, that's a lot of pressure because I've got to be something that, you know, the stereotype, you know, is it says that I'm not going to be a good dad. I'm going to leave my family. I'm going to uh, have multiple partners and multiple kids with those partners and all that because that's the reality. And so therefore, a lot of the black kids grow up without a dad. That's going to lead to a lot of these other areas. That's going to lead to the high drug use among blacks. That's going to lead to the high volume of black people in prisons. And, uh, and these are the types of things that black America is dealing with. And some of it, you know, you could look to certain individuals and you could put the blame on them. But here's what you can't do. You can't look at somebody and say, oh, that guy's black. Therefore, he is X, Y, Z. That would be totally uh, unfair. You can't be a respecter of persons. You go to somebody and say, hey, this is a human being. You know, this is uh, a soul that needs the Lord. This is somebody who has feelings, who needs a friend, somebody who, you know, has uh, these different pressures and different stress and all this stuff that I want to be a minister to. That's what, that's what our job is. Because the reality is, you got white people in all these categories, you know. You've got uh, you've got Latin, uh, Hispanics in all these categories. I mean, it's it's just it's out there. You know why? Because we're all humans. 
In human, the common denominator is that we're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God, right? And so we have to look at people and realize they're all sinners. Look at people and realize God loves all of them enough to send his son to die for them. And we need to uh, 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 realize that I've got to put cultural differences and maybe something that I don't like about the culture or something that, you know, our two cultures are at odds or whatever. And I got to put that beside me and say, I have got to just, you know, forget about all that, be uh, in, in the biblical sense, be all things to all people and just preach the gospel and not be a respecter of persons. Okay. But at the end of the day, here's another thing I, I just want to point out. I'm not going to also, I'm not going to apologize for being white. <laughs> That's a, What's the, you know, I have no, the, I had no choice over, <laughs> over being white. So just by me being white doesn't mean that I'm like an enemy to, uh, to black people. And that's what is going on with the media right now. It's like they're trying to push this idea that if you're white, you're the reason the blacks are, are poor and you're the reason that they're, uh, that they're this and that. I'm not going to push for being white. I'm not going to go out of my way to bow down. Who was it? The guy, the, uh, it wasn't the Chick-fil-A guy, was it? The hobby, it was either Hobby Lobby or Chick-fil-A, the guy that was like, you know, bent over and like was like washing the guy's shoes and like white people ought to be, be cleaning the black people's shoes. Was it Chick-fil-A? The Chick-fil-A guy? Uh, the owner of that. And he was trying to make a point, but it was weird. It was really weird, right? <laughs> just the bottom line is just be who God made you to be. Be yourself. Enjoy your culture. Enjoy your group of friends. But be open-minded to other cultures, accepting of other cultures and loving to other cultures. And, uh, and maybe you can learn something. Maybe you can intertwine some of your cultures together. And this is the point that I want to make this month, okay? And so, again, I know we're talking about world missions. And you're like, well, Black America, right? That's, that's not really world missions. But it is something that we need to deal with. Uh, and a people group that we're going to come in contact with a lot as we're out knocking doors. And we need to realize that there are differences, but that's okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I know I didn't uh, use a lot of your word, but hopefully the biblical principles and the scripture that I did use, Lord, would help us, inspire us, and, uh, and help us to just love people and not be a respecter of persons. Uh, we certainly wouldn't want other people judging us according to our skin color or culture. And so help us not to, uh, not to do that as well. Lord, we pray you be honored and glorified this month. Uh, be with the uh, guys out, to, uh, the, the families out today as they go soul winning and, and uh, just continue to do your work with us, Lord. Uh, give us uh, uh, peace in our hearts, boldness to go preach the gospel. Keep us from danger and, uh, and hindrances that would stop us from doing that. And I pray, Lord, that we bear much fruit for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.